It's, you know, getting a long breath hold and getting a long working breath hold is all about training over a long period. And I say this to the bull sharks, my training squad, uh, and it's not what you do tonight. It's not what even you do this week or even this month. It's the fact that you relentlessly keep turning up and you do it time and time again. That's what makes the changes. G'day guys, welcome to today's new Spiro. This is take two introduction with Turbo. Um, we, we, if you're uh, here for the first time, welcome to the new Spiro podcast. What do we do here? We interview the world's best Spiros every fortnight. Now, if you're an American listener and you don't know what that is, Shrek, what is a fortnight? It's a two-week period. It's a two-week period, fortnight. I like it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. The word doesn't really make sense, so it's not self-evident, Like unless you grew up with it. I can oh, see why they have something. We could talk about this for hours, <laughs> but we're here to talk about spearfishing. Yeah, we are, yeah. So what's, what's happened this week? Who have we got on the show, mate? Oh, I love this one. So we, we, we did our first live event at Wool and Gabba Adreno, and they, they put on this phenomenal venue for us late night. The store stayed open until 9 o'clock, and uh, we had 50 blokes in there. They rented chairs. We had pizza, beer, and we just chatted spearfishing all night. We had an open Q&A with the audience. We had bloody just stood around and had a laugh with a few people and got to meet a whole lot of long-time listeners, so it was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I had a ball. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. We interviewed... An absolute champion of Australian spearfishing, Wayne Judge. He's been around for quite a while, training spearos and freedivers alike. And uh, he was actually one of our very first interviews that we ever did that no one has ever heard. And the reason for that is we were terrible. We all got a little bit drunk. And then <laughs> after I listened to the audio, it was just a bunch of slurred ramblings of three drunk guys sitting in a room with a single microphone. So we, we ditched it and it never saw the light of day. So three years later... We're coming back to interview Wayne Judge live, our first live event in Adreno, and it, and it went off. It was excellent. Yeah. So the focus is on um, pool training to improve your spearfishing. So we dial right in on like finning technique, streamlining, CO2, O2 mechanisms, and training with a great bunch of guys in a focused way for a, uh, an, ex- an extended period of time. You know, like Wayne um, used to do an eight-week program, now he does a 12-week program. So we sort of cover through what happens in that sort of 12 weeks and the, the, some of the changes that people can expect and how that translates into your experience. That's a bloody good chat, and uh, we get pretty technical. We get technical, but then some great, uh, even if there's not a training venue near you, there's some great advice there to improve your spearfishing uh, that you can do in the water next time you go out, which is super important, particularly finning technique. But we'll wrap that up at the end of the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll give you some, we'll give you some takeaways at the end. Um, look, before we before we hook into this interview and uh, and it's a cracker, let's let's just cover off some news. So there's some national spearfishing titles in Australia this year in Victoria from February to March. Um, but there's an early bird registration. It's on before the, th- if you register before the 30th of November, you get a 10% discount and uh, you're also gonna get a bloody free Yazbek wetsuit. So that's a pretty cracker deal. Uh, head along to auf.com.au and check out that, um, check out that event. Yeah, that sounds absolutely awesome. I love a, a free wetty. Anyways, moving on. Uh, Insta is a great hashtag kicking around. This is awesome. One fish, one plastic. Basically encouraging everybody, every time they shoot a fish, to take a piece of plastic out of the ocean. We love that kind of stuff. Get around it. I mean, it doesn't have to be one plastic. It can be as much plastic as you like. Take as much plastic out of the ocean as we can. And uh, let's just keep our oceans looking good. It's a, it's a big job, but it's a positive step. Shrek? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're all over Insta. So um, if you want to connect with Insta, with um, No Spiro, ch- chuck, out, chuck on the hashtag No Spiro, and uh, we'll probably find it. I follow the hashtag on there, and it's great to see some of the guys coming through and uh, listeners of the show showing us their fish and what's happening in their lives. So, yeah, connect with us there. I also like this hashtag, one fish, one plastic. Get on it, have a go, and uh, see if you can do it. Like some places, especially where you're short of, you've got lots of access and there's lots of plastic to clean up. Shoot one fish, take one bit of plastic, easy. And, uh, yeah, um, you cra- caught up with a young uh, a, a guy on um, on the event night. What was his name? And you also hang out on the monitors for a bit? Yeah, yeah, so I uh, caught up with young Kyle Aim up there. Um, he's from the sunny coast. He made the trip down with his mate Jake. And uh, they're doing a bit of shore diving up there, getting a little crew together. And it was just awesome to talk to those boys because, you know, that's how a lot of us get started, dragging our mates into these things. And uh, they're having a ball, mate. And, um, yeah, best of luck to them. Keep, keep it up, fellas. You're starting to get a few good fish. They, uh, Kyle got his first parrot 
fish uh, this week. Yeah, this, yeah, which is awesome. And uh, they've kind of focused on getting a short eye of mackerel over the upcoming summer. So, well, oh, it's the right, so heading into the right season for it. I, I like the uh, other thing happening on instant. So, yeah, the Australian power couple. Oh, what was that about? Oh, over there? It was awesome. So, recently we uh, interviewed uh, Nikki Watts. Nikki Watt of the uh, famous couple Watt Bry on Insta, which is uh, Bryce and she, another fantastic Australian Spiro. And uh, we put it out uh, there that uh, who was Australia's premier power couple in spearfishing. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, it was Watt Bry versus Cripps and Tucker. So Jesse Cripps and Michael Takash, they've also been on the show earlier. And... Uh, and that was that was hilarious, but but he, I, I like the dark horses that come through. It was uh, it was a third option. There was a th- yeah. it was a third horse in the race. A couple of roughies. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, Tim Tim Knight and uh, and bloody Luke Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, what a pair of champions! And it they? turns out that the uh, the people have spoken and they love the roughy. The boys got <laughs> up, so bad luck to that's our a, power that, couples. That, that's a power couple we have yet to have on the show. So maybe they're headed up next. Look, um, also coming through on the review front. Um, wherever you listen to the the show, guys, it's great when you pump up a review. It helps other people find the show, and and uh, that's fantastic for us. But um, Chris McCartney in New Zealand left a review. He said, "Awesome podcast, heaps of experience and knowledge sharing, and hilarious banter. Keep it up, guys. Amazing work. A plus plus plus. I think that's triple A." <laughs> So, um, also from Costa Rica, Jonathan and Samantha reached out to us and told us about what's happening in, in their spear. And so, awesome guys, thanks for connecting with us. And uh, you can you can email Turbo at Noob Spear if, um, if you ever have anything bad to say about the show or want to give some feedback. If you've got something good to say, um, you really want to share your story. Send the bad stuff to me. Send the good stuff to Shrek. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Shrek at NoobSpearow.com. And uh, yeah, let's head into this interview. We're going to get into it with Wayne Judge. Beauty, let's do it. Well, welcome, guys. Um, thanks for coming along to our Noob Sparrow live event. It's absolutely excellent to do this. Yeah, never well, done it before, so yeah. And look, I would like to say from uh, Adreno and our customers, and uh, uh, we'd like to welcome the, the Noob Sparrow celebrities here. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, let's uh, get on. You guys are going to run the show, so um, put us through our paces. Absolutely. All right, so welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, Wayne. It's uh, awesome to have you with us, buddy. Um, look, tell us a bit about yourself and where you got started spearfishing. Look, uh, you know, I dove uh, snorkeling from quite early in my life, not realising that I had a bit of a breath hold, you know. Um, and then uh, at one point in time, my son, he was all of 18, 9, might have been early, 17, and uh, he brought this magazine to me and he said, have a look at this. And I opened it, and here it was, people like Greg Pickering and a few others, in this big spread, it was a, you know, one of these gentlemen's quarterly or something like that, you know, one of those <laughs> magazines. But the big spread about spearfishing, and we're, I'm looking through these pictures, and it's adventure, and it's huge fish, and it's and it's huge sharks, and and I'm like, I'm sc- spellbound. And he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I go, let's do that, and we've both be doing, been doing it ever since. That's it. So how old were you? Forty. So young, Forty when young, you started spearing. Yes, yeah, so I was just a young pup. You know. How old are you now? Sixty-three. All right, I wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Phew, I got that. You know, now I can sort of relax the rest uh, of the afternoon. Good. You know, <laughs> like, I, so starting at forty is a bit better than maybe starting at twelve in some ways because you've got a bit of knowledge about you. But but what obstacles did you have? Look, I think. Um, I didn't foresee or, or even envision any obstacles. I was just getting out there with Ant and we were just shooting fish and eating them. And there was like, there wasn't obstacles there, you know? The, it, the only obstacle was that, oh, damn, Saturday has got us southerly blowing and, oh, God, it puts that out, you know? So you, you guys joined a, a club down there pretty early on, yeah? Tell yeah. us about that. Yeah. Look, um, uh, we're, we're wondering... Where do we go from here? We wanted to do it. Where do we go from here? And we were at the point where I think I had a, a Sea Hornet and he had another gun and we are kind of like going, what are we going to do now? And then out of the blue we realised that there were clubs in Sydney yeah. and uh, we got a line to the club called North Shore Underwater Club based on the northern beaches. 
So we came along, I went along to a meeting of theirs, and I went, gee, this is pretty interesting, and thinking, these people know what the fish is all about, you know, and they did seem knowledgeable, but they didn't really talk much in their club meetings. It was sort of like a barbecue and a lot of beer went down, and that was about all, you know. So they said, come along to a competition. Now, whether it was just luck or whatever, this competition we went along to, a mentor of ours, Ted Lau, landed a 50 or 60 kilo marlin wow. at a competition. Wow. And then another one of the guys, and this was overshadowed, but his name was Matt Hare, and he landed a, something like a 9 kilo snapper. And I'm sitting there going, I'm completely stunned. I'm going, these guys know what they're talking about. Yeah. So at that point I went, we've got to do this, Ant, you know. And so we joined the club, and that's what we did. That was it. Mm-hmm. So this Todd guy was an early mentor? Ted. Ted. Ted Lauer. <laughs> My usual <laughs> professional standard. Sorry about that. <laughs> He'll love you. Yeah, look, Ted owned Extreme Spear Fishing in Sydney, yeah. and that's a shop on the northern beaches. Ted Lauer. Uh, God, he's, he's actually a little bit older than me, and he started when he was in his teens. So he, I might have, what, 23 years of experience, or he's got like 40 years of experience, you know, and he's done, uh, you know, something like... 20 coral sea trips, you know, yeah. that type of thing, yeah. you know. So the guy, he knew his onions, you know, there's no doubt about it. And he kind of, because they didn't have a lot going on in the club at the time, he took Ant and I under his wing a bit and sort of gave us a little bit of instruction. And I remember, you know, I'm, I'm out there one day, you know, I walked in there, talked to him and walked out with a Rob Allen gun, you know, and so that was a... You've uh, done that to me. <laughs> <laughs> That was really good. And then he goes, oh, just go down. He's put some burley in the water and, uh, you know, see what comes up. So I went down to the local spot, back of the bow, put some burley in the water, and I'm putting burley, believe it or not, this is how newbie I was, I'm putting burley in the water I'm going, I don't see how this is going to work in my mind. I don't see how this is going to work. How will they know this? It's not going to spread out that far, you know. Yeah. And I'm still cutting this fish up, and then I'm the next thing I go, I feel like I'm being looked at. I look up, and here's a school of kingfish around me. Oh, wicked. And I'm going, whoa. So I, I freak out, drop my knife, <laughs> shoot a kingfish, but then I go, all of a sudden I realise one little bit of technique put burly in the water. Yeah. And next thing I've got a fish that I was dreaming about. You know, it wasn't a big fish, but it was legal, you know. I was just talking with some of the other guys before the, the interview about how good those first fish taste. <laughs> Sorry, Turbo. No, you're right. I'm just going there as usual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just how good were those first fish? Man, the first fish are really good. There's no doubt about how it. Did you know? you cook, how did you cook the king? Let me think. Oh, deep fry. I'm a deep fry addict, you know. Kiwi. Typical kiwi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can make batter. You know, I can make a better batter. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the one you got. What about what about the fish that got away? There must be a memorable fish that you've missed over here. Look, the one that got away was on Ken Reef. We jumped in the first time I'm there. Ant's over there. Ted Lau's there. I'm there. Now, Ted Lau is a team player. There's no doubt about it. I'm there, and this fish came up to my teasers, and I'm looking the other way. Ted's screaming at me. And I go, what's that noise, you know? <laughs> and uh, next thing I look up, and he's yelling at me, like, almost like, look at your teaser. I look down the teaser, and here's this dog tooth tuna. It was huge. <laughs> it's like gnarly. And I'm a long, not long, but I'm far away from it. And it was gnarly, and it had scars all over it. And I'm aimed with this huge 1.4 Rob Allen. And I sort of swimming up to it, and I, you know, Typical, I swam at it, you know, with my eyes like this, you know, big and wide, going, you know, going, what am I getting myself into? (laughs) So uh, I put a shot on it. It was actually a well-placed shot, but it was too far away. Uh, Clear water, first dive of the trips, everything, all the the stuff that you do, sometimes even more than just the first time, you know, (laughs) and I'm put a spear in it and it went down there and it took my float down, first float down, the second float started on its wow. way and then it pulled out. Oh, wow. So oh. Ted, who knew these things, he said that was a 100 kilo doggy. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. 
That was when the Australian record was 80-something, you know, in Puckridge's record back then. What's the record now, like 102 or something? Yeah. And John, John's one? Yeah. So you... That's a world record, not an Australian record. So obviously starting with your son was pretty special, yeah? Yeah, that was special. And having him hang off the back of your fins, and what, what was, what was a memorable experience you guys had? Look, I can remember, you know, we went through it when he was really young, you know, grabbing him in the bath, you know, and go, one, two, splash, his head's under, and he comes up and he goes, what the hell are you doing to me <laughs> as a baby? So we went through all that, but really when we started diving out in the ocean and he's, you know, he got his first snorkel set when he was four years old and little fins and things like that and North Bondi pool, he's up to my knees, his waist or whatever it was and he, is, he even saw a little fish in that pool and he chased that fish like for most of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So at four years old, we had a calm day there and I grabbed his hand and we went out into the ocean and he was just squealing through the snorkel. <laughs> at all the fish he saw, you know, oh, and yeah, that was so. little moeys and, and various other things, you know. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of where it got cracked. And then later on, I remember he was all of about eight or nine or something like that and uh, we're down there and I'm wanting to show him a, 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 a wobby gong. Mm. And we... And I'm down there and it's about mm, maybe five or six metres or something and I'm going, pointing it out and I'm down there and it was a clear day. And next thing I went to look up at him and he wasn't up on the surface. He was down there, you know, with the hand spear and he's kind of like yeah, yeah. digging around and I'm digging at the wobby gong, you know. <laughs> look, I wouldn't like to have left it to him. He might have given yeah, it a good yeah. jolly poke, you know. <laughs> but that was a really good time to realise that with, even without, uh, you know, lots of coaching, he'd just... Boom, bomb died to a good old five or six metres. <laughs> so with the young guys coming into the shop now, you work here at Adreno, obviously they ask, you know, they, they want to know some baseline sort of techniques and stuff. What do you what do you tell them? Like, especially here in South East Queensland, how do you tell them to get started? Look, really, it's all about basics. And, you know, the first thing to do is, especially the young guys, is, is you can't tell them to do a certain depth or a certain anything really you've just got to let the curiosity drive them and mm. and I'm still doing that now you know I let my curiosity drive me you know I get deep because I'm curious what's down there you know mm. and uh, that's more I work more on that angle you know mm. but then they'll go well it's I'm interested in a jewfish or I'm interested in this and then we roll over where you find it you know and they go well can you tell me your jewfish spots and I go no <laughs> <laughs> and I said this is where you learn your skills how to recognize and uh, a jewfish spot or how to to look where to know where to look for them you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and so it, it you know teach a person where he can find a jewy yeah. and he'll start recognizing oh there's a yeah, cave yeah. here oh this is here you know so what, what is your favorite species why? Well, Look, I have to say, although it's, you know, I haven't got a huge one, it is dogtooth tuna. Yeah. I just love them, the fact that they're so dynamite. They go from nothing to instant ballistic in seconds, yep. you know. So uh, they are my favourite species. What about a few tips on doggies? I know there's a few guys here that want to shoot a doggy. Yeah. We know that you've shot a few doggies. Yeah. So the thing about uh, that I think is, you know, You've got to be with a good team, and it's, this is the crucial thing. You can get, have all your individual stuff in, and you don't look at the fish, and so you make, you make the fish come to you because you're making them curious, mm. and things like that. You can have all that in, and your teammates spoil it because three of you are diving on the same fish. Yep. And they, you know, three on the same fish, the fish starts swimming away, and then they go and wound it in the tail, and then the sharks eat it, you know. So that doesn't make sense. So, so tell us about a dog tooth team. What does it look like? You got, you got one guy that's on the gun, one guy's on the what, on the flasher. Everybody has a different way of doing it, and the way What's we, your way? What's yeah, your way? we had a way in the in the coral sea, where we would have one guy on the dory. Yep. and three guys in the water and three guys with flashes and we'll be drifting along in a triangle. Yeah. Now, when you see something, you'll see a doggy, well, you let the other guys know and you start pointing. And that means now that three people know there's a doggy around or there's something happening. Hang on. How do you signal the other guys because you're all flat out looking down? Well, we're all in viewpoint each other, so you, you're looking down and you're looking over at them and you're looking down and you're looking behind you and then you're looking down some more and then, so you're always in communication with each other and if the vis goes down you just get closer, you know, or if a big shark comes in you get closer. <laughs> so the vis goes down you get a bit closer, so it's always in clear vis. 
So I look up and let's say Ant's over there and he's pointing and I go, he's seen something there, you know. So, but we don't break our formation. The doggy will go somewhere, usually oh. to someone's teaser. The guy on the boat, he's chopping fish up. Oh, right. And he throws a bit of fish on one, you know, and of course his game is to hit you on the head, you know, and a bit of fish on another, you know, and it's not a huge amount. You know, the old school was you, you know, you barely every frame from the day before and they fill the water and if you can get a doggy before <laughs> the sharks arrive and destroy everything, you're lucky, you know. Slow and steady. Yeah, so just bits at a time, three or four pieces, you know. And now the doggy will come in, or the doggies, there's quite often two or three of them, will come in somewhere and you never know. They might go flying past one teaser and go to the other teaser. Mm. So, but now we're all aware you know, so then when your doggy goes into a set of teasers, the person who teases is that's who's playing the game with that doggy. Oh, right, eh? Okay, so then of course you don't dive on that doggy, and you know you dive slightly away and you sort of wheel yourself around and depending where he's at, you know, and uh, hopefully he's staying interested in the teaser, and uh, <clears throat> at that point you may get a shot. Now the beauty about when you've got a team like that is if there's two or three, and there usually is two or three or sometimes more doggies, is that when you get one on, another one will come up and have a look. Right. And we call this, Ted calls this, phone a friend. So what? So the hard part is you get this 20 kilo doggy come up and everyone's sitting there wanting a 40 kilo one, so they don't want to go down and shoot the 20 kilo <laughs> one. But whoever's teaser it comes to, he goes down there and takes the doggy. Yeah, right. And then another one's liable to pop up. Soon as one's on, Everyone closes in together. Now, if by some chance someone leaves their teaser out, well, now that's the, the boaty's job is to go and do that. He's the, he's the most important person. He is the orchestrator. Mm -hmm. He feeds the divers burly. He take, picks up the teasers. If anyone's getting hassled by sharks, he's there straight away. So he can't sleep. He's, he's crucial on it. So then you've got uh, everyone comes in. So you've got one person with a doggy on and he's pulling it up and you've got two either side. You know, and when you've got a team there, it's not a big deal who's going down to get the next one, yeah, you know. Yeah. And we've they've run it down 20 kilo, 40 kilo, 50 kilo. Sometimes you've gone three in a row like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that team's based <coughs> approach is something we've heard thousands of times of blue water hunting. The triangle idea sounds really good because, like you say, you've got coverage from both sides bringing that in. All right, let, let's move on. Just hang on, oh, one, one okay, quick question. Right. And we've talked about this before, Wayne, before our trips. How do you find, I know you look at maps and stuff like that, how do you find, what are you looking for in a good uh, part of a reef for doggies? That's a good point, mainly pressure points. Pressure points. You want current hitting um, some uh, terrain. Whether it's a bommy or a, an island or a point or something like that, mm. an upwelling of some sort puts the bait fish in action, the fusiliers, things like that. The doggies will visit there. We've often found the doggies like to come late in the afternoon rather than during the day. Um, we've often found come four o'clock, and we're all thinking we've got to get back before they get angry at their ship, you know, but four o'clock, all of a sudden, it comes to life, and there's yeah. doggies, and there's jobbies, and there's all sorts of things, you know, so, uh... Hey, look, um, toughest situation, what's the, what's the toughest moment you've had out on the water? What happened, and what did you learn from it? <laughs> yeah, now I have to admit to being a bit dumb, you know? <laughs> That's part of it, we're, yeah. all, we're all like that. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> I had, uh, we were out on a comp uh, off uh, Long Reef Point and I was uh, driving the boat. It was a large 14 foot rubber ducky. It was one of those days, it was dead calm with a huge swell, so it had semblance of being safe. We had fish around, we had pilot whales around us. It was really happening, you know, it was a very interesting day. And uh, I took us too close to Long Reef Point. Now, Long Reef Point is got some nice big bombies out the front yeah, there yeah. and you can actually get round them without a problem but when you have a three meter swell all of a sudden oh, yeah. it's dead flat and the next thing you've got a three meter wall breaking on you and that's what happened you know i went around there and next thing it's dead flat i'm going and the next thing all of a sudden i'm facing the three meter wall and it just flipped us you know Ooh, five divers in the water oh. including my son and uh his best friend at the time ashley bowler and uh, who's, uh, who now owns extreme spearfishing, he's stayed in it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm in the water going, my God, I did this, you know. So it's one of those, one of the things you go, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so I what, wish that didn't happen. What did, what did you learn from it? 
Look, uh, you know, don't drive too close to the land. That was pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just keep well away from the land. You're not supposed to be on the land so, on a boat. You so know. Why, why were you there, though? Uh, look, you kind of want to drop divers off in the right place where the water's going to yeah. be great, you know. Where it's breaking. Yeah, well, you know, on the outside of that. And, you know, you, you've got this place where it's not breaking and then you might have a, a swell where the breaks in further and then all of a sudden you get those big ones, the set comes in. Well, you know, that's just being... A, not knowledgeable enough, mm. you know. So that was fairly early on, and yeah, I don't think I've gone that close to the land since. Yeah, no. oh, it's common, you know, like especially with new boaties, like you know, these are the mistakes you make, and so it's good to hear you listen. Hey guys, have you thought about buying a freediving watch? I think lots of us have. Many of the guests on our show swear by them. If you are sort of a little bit confused and overwhelmed by thinking about which freediving watch to buy, I've got some solution for you today. Go to spearfishing.com.au forward slash computers and have a look in there. There's an Adreno how-to video about how to choose a good dive watch. Now, one of the watches that gets mentioned a lot on the show is the Sunto D4. And they've lately come out with the D4F, which is a free diving uh, dedicated watch. It cuts out a lot of the features that we don't need that scuba divers want. Uh, so it doesn't have tables and things like that, which is just a nice streamlined, uh, simple watch to help you monitor your dive times and more importantly, your surface intervals. So go to spearfishing.com.au forward slash computers and watch their how-to vid on how to choose a good um, free diving watch. If you do decide to buy a watch from spearfishing.com.au, use the code NoobSpero and save $20 on every purchase over 200 and support the NoobSpero podcast at the same time. It was 99 tips to get better at spear fishing. It's all about free diving, hunting techniques, boat diving, shore diving, everything spear fishing is in there. And, and guess what? As an audio book, it is free. It's free on Audible for our listeners. Shrek, how do they get themselves a copy of the free 99 tips audio book? There's two ways. Come to today's show notes page and click on the Audible trial link and it'll take you through where you can get a free book of your choice and a 30-day membership for nothing. Or you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash noobspero, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O and get your hands on a free book of your choice. You don't even have to get 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Yeah, but that'd be the best thing, wouldn't it? Well, it's the best book on there, but, you know, like I didn't, I didn't want to be too self-promoting. Yeah, well, I, I, to be honest with you, I got on there. I was going to get the book, but I instead I got Jamie Oliver um, Cook. I that was pretty good. Let's be honest, you you didn't get that. You, you got a romance, a paranormal romance book. <laughs> <laughs> Head over to audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Right, so veteran, Veterans Vault is the part of the Noob Spiro podcast where we focus in on our featured guest sort of area of expertise and Wayne is very much an authority with regards to the freediving component to spearfishing and in particular the training aspect. So we're going to just hammer right in on yeah. that if that's the right way. Hammer away. Alright, so I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your history as a coach. I know that Shrek and I have both trained under you. I know that Steve over there has trained with you and a lot of guys in Brisbane have come through your school. But you've also trained a lot of top-end athletes, uh, a lot of good free divers, unlike ourselves. Um, <laughs> though you, you had a red-hot go, but you can't polish a turd. So I was going to say, yeah, uh, I wanted to know... <laughs> you say it. Yeah. Well, I say you can't make strawberry jam out of shit. <laughs> well, thanks, mate. Either way. What are you most proud of as a, a free diving coach? There's probably two things I'm most proud of. Uh, it's an interesting thing because it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. I get a kick out, and people don't know it, but I, I get a huge emotional kick when I you get, get people... Passionate. Yeah, when people hit personal bests and you see them come out it and they go, you know, five weeks earlier they didn't even envision it and the next thing they swim to something that's been a dream for them. Yeah. Mm. That kicks me. That is a buzz. I remember the time um, when we started with you and like everyone did like a 50 metre swim in the pool. Turbo did 20, but we all celebrated. With it. <laughs> yeah. it was a huge, <laughs> was a huge experience for me. And I, I, I vicariously sensed everything you were just talking about. So, yeah, 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 no. Yeah, well, that was a tough day, Turbo. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I, the next question was, what athlete has surprised you the most and why? And was it my 20 metre swim? No, well actually, let's get back to the first question because there is something here. There's yeah. two things I'd like to say here. Um, I come across a guy online and his name was Tank Said and he's an actor, an Australian actor in um, the US. Is that a name drop? Anyway, Tank, um, he just contacted me because he found that I did a monofin workshop. And he wanted to help because he wanted to uh, increase his distance and that. And we started talking and next thing I started realising the guy is fairly passionate and he's got a, a really strong spirit about what he wants to do. Mm. So he, we, uh, I coached him online. Um, we're talking uh, uh, Skyping every second day. He would send me videos, underwater videos of his technique and tell me what he's going through. And, uh, and look, with Tank, the best bet, you just tell him keep going because he was just rolling through what we all roll through. It's a little bit of self-doubt, a little bit of carbon dioxide poisoning that makes you think you want to give up, you know, and various other things like that. And, uh, and, but the guy was very intent. And the next thing, he started pulling distances, serious distances. And so, uh, you know, he decided he was going to go for the Australian record. Mm -hmm. And he just went about it and went for the Australian record. I think it's the record that still stands, the dynamic uh, apnea in the pool. With, it's uh, like a 200-metre swim. 217 or 18, Crazy I think it massive. was. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And we'd never met. He's since come here and introduced himself here, and we've had a, a good old talk, but we'd never met. It was all online, and it was a, a great... <laughs> Thing that you can do online, you know, it was brilliant. What sort of time frame? How long were you doing that for to get him to that sort of distance? Six months? Oh, it wasn't even that. Oh, yeah. It was probably less than that. So the guy was very able, but, you know, yeah. it was a bit concentrated, you know, and I had a bit of time when I was in Gladstone and I was, uh, you know, giving it to him, you know, about what he can do. And you'd go, oh, no, 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 no. I'd say, no, just get in there and do it. And he would do it. And look, the, he's a great guy, a very good publicist, and he, he came back here and he had a great interview with the guys on Fox and he said, he mentioned my name and yeah, said, nice. you guys are doing he, well with he, me. Not only was he interviewed by Fox, but Noob Spiro also interviewed him. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There was at least 50 people listen to that. <laughs> it was a big moment. It was early days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so apart from Turbo, uh, with his huge gain from 5 metres to 20, mm. um, what is, who, who's someone that surprised you? This is the, uh, this is the thing about um, training swimmers. Trained swimmers are so much fun to train into freediving because a swimmer loses their... Uh, competitiveness on their level when they hit about, I don't know, 25, 26. They're great athletes up until then. Then they don't quite get the times that they want. Well, our athletes in freediving, they come into their best late 30s and early 40s. So what that does is that gives their swimmers a whole area to move into mm. where they can keep going as mm. competitors. Mm. So uh, ace trained swimmer came in one of my first spearfishing training for free divers. And I'm watching this guy move through the water and I'm going, my God, this guy moves through the water. Fantastic. And then uh, next thing, he, I, he takes his fins off and he starts doing no fins. And I'm looking at the no fins. I'm going, this guy's got some basics. Mm. So I said to him, uh, look, see me after. I'll show you. I'll give you a couple of tips on how to do... Uh, dynamic no fins, which means not coming up for a breath, you know, it's just it's the same breaststroke thing. So he, uh, he uh, said, okay, so I went through and there's really three easy processes. And for someone who's trained with how to kick with uh, dynamic, uh, with uh, breaststroke and how to stroke with breaststroke, it's really easy to go into the underwater stroke. So I showed him those and he went, okay. And I said, look, next week we'll just let you go as far as you want to go with this, all right? He was obviously a, a, he's a Spiro and he's a strong swimmer and that. So I said, no, we'll let you go. So he came in and uh, he took his fins off and the next thing, away he goes, and he swum 112 metres. Wow. As the per first personal best he did. So I went, my hell, this guy's pretty hot. His name's Bo Armstrong. He's a friend of you guys. Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> I think part of the reason he looked so majestic in the water was that huge Pony. flowing ponytail we had. Yeah. <laughs> we had to tie it up and, you know, put it under a huge cap, you know. He looked like a Rastafarian. Yeah. You know? Anyway, uh, he went on. There's a bit of a story. He went on there. From there, he um, 
I gave him a monofin, and the next thing he's pulling, you know, 150s with the monofin. And then he uh, went on and did the Australian uh, Nationals that year. This is the year, there is a, a, you'll understand it for those who know, this is the year that Ant came up from his static. This is my son who is contesting the Australian Nationals. Came up from his static. He'd just come back from Hawaii. He wasn't too worried about a pool competition. He came up and he said, I just left the oven on at home. <laughs> and it's famous for that. We still talk about this all the time, you know. And uh, that was my home, and I started worrying about the yeah, oven, yeah. you know. <laughs> but no, it was just what he did. And because he did that, and because Bo did three strong uh, swims, Bo was Australian national champion there. Yeah. Well, I've never heard that. So he, Bo always talks about this. So he literally, he kind of won this out of default. Really. <laughs> Look, I wouldn't say That's that really about Bo. Bo was a serious <laughs> contender. Uh, we'll call him, we'll call call him default Bo now. <laughs> default <laughs> default Bo. Like right, let, let's yeah, move let's on. Right, so Turbo and I met in one of your training workshops in a swimming pool here in Brisbane. It was a romantic encounter. <laughs> I saw that he had as many struggles as any Spiro oh. could ever have. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, with the Noob Spiro idea, he was the perfect dude because... We met half our crew there, half our mates today. Some of them are here tonight. Where is he staying? And, um, <laughs> and, and so we know, like, these events, can they can build relationships that last forever, but they're also really useful in terms of building your freediving performance for spearfishing. So we wanted to plug you with a few questions about what your training looks like, how other people can maybe replicate some of what you do and teach. And so let's get started with some questions. Absolutely. So... Uh, you train in blocks like, you know, anyone sensible. So I was hoping that you'd run us through what a Wayne Judge Beginner Spiro uh, training block would look like. Mm. So the concept of training in blocks is that you want to take something from somewhere to somewhere. If you just go along and I'm going to train every day or something like that and you don't have any direction, you actually don't get anywhere. You get a bit of improvement, but you actually don't get somewhere. So you need to be able to take your weak points and turn them into strong points. Take your strong points and further back them up to make you stronger. So that's the whole concept. Mm -hmm. We started off doing eight-week blocks. This is what I started with. And I chose eight weeks as being the smallest time that you could put something in that would stay with the person for life. So I've increased that now because I'm doing 12-week blocks because it helps with, um, uh, I do four a year. You know? oh, yeah. So I have a, a spring block, a, I mean, started on the spring block yeah. now, and we've got a summer one, and then we've got a, a, a fall, and then we've got a winter one, and that's mm. basically the way we run it. So they're uh, basically 12 weeks. Okay, so like, let's go into some specifics. So a guy comes in, he's flat out swimming 25 metres on the bottom of the pool uh, with his fins on, um, at the start of the program, in 12 weeks, where can you take them? What, what's, what's the range? Yeah, it's a really a, an individual thing because you're going to run into people who are blessed with the ability to hold their breath. Mm. And out of the blue there, you know, you've got someone and he goes, oh, I think I can do 50, <laughs> and then two weeks later he's done 75, <laughs> and a couple of months later, when you guys are finished, I don't know, <laughs> and a couple of months later he's done 100 metres. Now, there are guys that run through it like that. And then you've got guys who, you know, they'll do a 50 and it's a bit of a struggle. Yep. Uh, and they're working it and working it. So you're running through people with different range and mm. you've got to be able to run with that. And the way we work that is that we've got an exercises that people can do to their level. And it's really important. Your coach can't go, you have to now swim 100 metres or 50 metres underwater mm. uh, because the guy will go down there and black out, you know. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. So, so what, you buddy them up in, in pairs of similar ability? Hopefully in similar ability. But, you know, if you've got a, someone who, who can Turbo. communicate, oh, you sorry, know, no, so, no, no, say we're buddying you two up, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but Turbo would be able to tell you, look, I'm, I'm going for 25 to 30 <laughs> metres. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then you will understand what is a big swim for Turbo. I always like the res rescue drills at the end where he was drowning trying to pull me back to the start. But yeah. it's, it's not fair. That, that, we, we'll you had to rescue you know. the rescue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um, you, you work on a couple of aspects. One's fitness straight away. Yeah. So yeah. what does that look like? So in the, in the 12 week program, we do probably three weeks sometimes with fitness. Now, hopefully at that time, the guys go, yeah, right. 
I'm going to get fit and I'll run some fitness stuff on them but they want to actually do a lot outside as well and they should be doing cycling and running and swimming on the surface you That's know what this, I do. and this is not about breath hold at this time this is about getting all your air going you know when you you really run hard or cycle hard you get to that point where you you, you feel congested because and you're coughing stuff up because you're you've uh, now made air go into an area that you weren't using and now you've emptied that out. This is important to do because if you don't clean that out, it's only going to be bigger next year. Is that is that that VO two max kind of capacity that you're building there? No, or? no. What you're doing here is Sorry, all, you're, <laughs> all you're doing is you've got mucus and unused sections of your lungs, and you're learning how to use them, and you're forcing yourself to use them. And now, because you've forced yourself with hard stuff, you're coughing stuff up that's been stored in there. Mm. So it's important to do that, but you can't run a whole program on fitness because breath hold goes in the opposite direction. Mm. In fitness, you've got a ton of air and you're yeah. trying to get your circulation up. <clears throat> you're trying to get your heart pumping. That's important to do at the beginning of the program because you're now going to go into a section and you're going to move through a gradient to at the end of the program, you're now slowing everything down. You're slowing your heart rate. You're constricting your your blood to your core. So you're it's going the opposite than what you're doing in a fitness thing. And so the important thing is you roll through that. At the beginning you're doing the aerobic, and halfway through, at when you're starting to change, now you're moving into your tables and you're getting used to carbon dioxide and you're getting used to low oxygen and that. And we work those through, and then towards the end we're now even... Right now, they're, they're swimming kilometre a night, sometimes a kilometre underwater in 50 metres or 100 metre swims, depending on the level of the diver, you know. So later on, they might do one big max, maybe one that's a little bit less, and then work on technique the rest of the night. Whereas, you know, so you've gone from high level yeah. to single swims with a bit of work on the stuff to the, at the final end. And at the end of the program, we then do what we call a max night where a person can swim their full capacity, their, what they think they can do. Mm. They don't have to. They're just a big night where they've got safety in the water with them and they've got safety on the edge of the pool with yeah. them and they can come up on the edge. Mm. So that's the culmination through the whole a, program. A, a lot of guys listening are spearers, right? And they think the best training for spearfishing is more spearfishing. Um, what do you say to that? You know what? I think if all of us could get three or four days into beautiful water a week who the hell would swim in a pool yeah. yeah you know really i sure wouldn't but at night time when i've got spare time after i've worked all day yeah. i've got spare time i can go to the pool and i'm not going to pound the pavement running around in some neighborhood i'm not going to even get on an exercise cycle and you know watch the news as i'm exercising. that's just not me i'm a i'm a diver i yeah. swim underwater in a pool all right um Judge, we want to move on to CO2 tolerance because it's really important to diving. Um, I, I wanted to sort of ask you why it's important for spearfishing and, yeah. and how to train that and some of the dangers associated yeah. with it as well. Yeah, okay. So the thing about CO2 tolerance is that everybody has a certain tolerance and a certain reaction to CO2 to the point where we've had a person go into the pool, happened our First max night, Ant and I are on our very first max night in Sydney free divers. It's all happening, we're going, yeah. And he is our first swimmer of the night. This person we didn't know did not have any effects of carbon dioxide. He just kept going. He just kept Wouldn't going. Didn't feel the urge to breathe. Didn't feel oh, the urge no. to breathe. No so, contractions. Yep. And later on, when I got to question him about it, he just felt better and better the more he swam. Right. So he swam a certain distance, and next thing he's on the bottom, blacked out. We're like, whoa. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> first night, first swim of the night, oh, and we're like, rough. this is where it starts, you know. So we drag him out, and everything's fine, you know. We know we had our rescues down. We were mentored by Ant Williams and Andy Ross and some of the – and Nathan Watts and uh, yeah, yeah. people like that. These are good free divers. We knew how to handle safety. We had him out. He was fine shortly. We had no idea what occurred. So later on I talked to him and he just didn't get CO2. And that's a dangerous person to train with. He didn't get the reactions of CO2. So this is someone who would have benefited enormously just from learning that about themselves, training in the pool. Yeah, because probably if they did that lived in the because ocean, of that. If yeah. they did that in the ocean, it's it. game over. All right, so other end of the spectrum, we're talking about me here. 
Oh, I feel CO2 flat out just sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you go about shaping me into, what's this guy's name? Bo, Bo Armstrong. Bo, and a Bo Armstrong, let's just say <laughs> Super that. Bo. Yeah, exactly. So how do, how do I start to deal with CO2? They've got those <clears throat> ponytails you can buy them and you just <laughs> clip them on. <laughs> So the interesting thing about CO2 is when you, uh, you, we've got exercises that bring a person's tolerance to CO2 up, and they're tables, CO2 tables. You're going to read about them, and you're going to find, you can find them on the internet and things like that. And now I've often heard people say, how do you get longer breath holds? And someone just turn around and goes, CO2 tables. And the, yeah, and, and nothing else added to that. And that is kind of like risky. Because what you're doing is you're doing something to the very trigger that tells you to go and breathe, or CO2. So you get used to CO2, you're getting used to the thing that makes you safe. So now, you, so you've got to actually have this with good sense. So it's great to do CO2, and CO2 tables are part of our training. But the way we work at it is we've got to make a person responsible for the changes that he's going to have, and that... A, and this is especially a, a, a sparrow. He doesn't have all these safeties around. And the ocean is a harsh mistress. So he has to be ready for the fact that if he's going to drill on CO2 and handle that trigger that's going to tell him to breathe, he better dive with a buddy who knows what he's talking about. And he better have a buddy up there that he's going to go down there and dive, what, 25 metres or whatever like that, and come up and find the buddy has gone off and speared a, a wahoo that came up to him or something like that. Well, that doesn't make sense. You know, if the guy is, is full on working on the edge of his limits or, or working hard or he's done something to his CO2 trigger, which means got used to it. Okay, so what is a CO2 trigger? So we're talking about <clears throat> CO2 tables, so you're learning to control this urge to breathe. Yeah. But what is another thing that sparrows commonly do to get around this, the awful contractions that none of us seem to like? Yeah, right. Okay, so the other thing which is actually was taught as a way to handle a person's ability to dive long was to hyperventilate. Yep. So hyperventilate lowers your carbon dioxide. You're all sitting there now and you're all going to be uh, around about, unless someone's holding their breath, you're all going to be somewhere around about 96 to 98% oxygen saturated in your blood. This is where you sit at generally when you're normally breathing. So three or four long, slow, deep breaths, and you're up there. You're 100%. You don't need any more. Anything after that is hyperventilation. Now, hyperventilation does nothing but lower the CO2. So it can actually make your dive comfortable because it's the CO2 that gives you the urge to breathe and gives you the contractions. So, you know, you're going along, you go... You start contracting. It's the CO2 that does that. So the point is with that, if you're hyperventilating, you're putting yourself into sort of a dangerous, mm -hmm. dangerous ground. And so you're saying CO2 tables can help us to develop this tolerance as well. But what's the benefit to us then? So the point is, is rather than destroy the, the, the trigger by lowering your CO2 so that you're not having these things, is that you learn to recognise what the reaction is and... and be able to tolerate it. Now, that's a bit different. That means you get a contraction, how do you tolerate it? All you can tolerate, there's the contraction, you tolerate it. It's a bit different than no contractions and now you've got to go 20 metres up and black out on the way so, up. I was just going to say that, like, when you're down at 20 metres and you get, like, a serious contraction <coughs> and you realise how far you've got to go, it can cause a little moment of panic. And I think that was one really useful thing to it that yeah. I like. Yeah. Your pool training is good for that because yeah. you start learning where you get your contractions, yeah. what it feels like. And what and you're capable of after that. Yeah. 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 And once again, it's all different, you know. Yeah. I get contractions and I'm not even halfway through my swim. So what's the difference between doing a CO2 table on dry land and doing one in the pool like in your program? Yeah, what, what, would, a, what would CO2 pool training look like? So I remember... OK, here's an example of a really simple one uh, that a lot of the guys do in, in the bull sharks, and it's... Um, we'd start off slow, we let them get, you know, a little bit confident, and so they sort of feel a little bit, yeah, i got this, you know, and it's... Uh, you do a, a 50 metres and two-minute recovery. 50 metres, a minute and a half recovery. 50 metres, a minute recovery. 50 metres, 30 seconds recovery. 50 metres, 15 seconds recovery. 50 metres, 
15 seconds recovery, 50 metres. That's one that's quite usual for some of the guys who've been doing it for a while. Now, to go lower on the recoveries, well, we used to do them down to three breaths. Yep. Yeah, I remember. You know? yeah, but awesome. actually, you turn the table from a CO2 table into an oxygen table when you start doing that. Yeah. Okay. When you're doing a CO2 table, you're not training your ability to have low oxygen. You're training your ability to tolerate CO2. Yeah. To turn it into an oxygen table, it's not healthy. Okay, so CO2 tables and O2 tables are different. How Very are they different? different? CO2 restricts recovery. Yep. So you're doing your exercise with restricted recovery. Okay. A oxygen table uh, lengthens your exercise without restricting recovery. Okay, what are the benefits? Uh, Probably what you're doing when you're doing general tra uh, training is you're working on the oxygen side. Yeah. You're working on, you know, not restricting your recovery. You know, you might do uh, 50 or 75 metres or something and you recover for a minute and a half or something. Not really restricted and then you do another one and you recover. Mm -hmm. You're kind of doing a bit of an oxygen table because you're working on the edge of where it feels tough, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're constantly putting yourself up there where your oxygen levels are now a bit lower and a bit lower, you know. Mm -hmm. And to do them as a table is quite beneficial, you know. I think my first five-minute static I did as an oxygen table, you know. It was a, um, what was it, a, a minute breath hold, two-minute recovery, two-minute breath hold, two-minute recovery, three-minute breath hold, two-minute recovery, four-minute breath hold, two-minute recovery, five-minute breath hold. Cool. It's a great table. Mm. You know, for for what suicide? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you don't say you have to do five minutes. You might sort of do a three minute one, and then you know you're actually struggling. Yeah. So you just do another two and a half or something like that. You get yourself into that area and you move it because it's time in the water, up in those levels that give you the benefits. So the the O2 tables get you to be a bit leaner and use less oxygen. No, the, the O2 table, yeah, well, it does. It does, but it actually gets you to tolerate low levels of oxygen as well. Right. You know? Okay. So uh, you, uh, you get the levels down, and you're going to find people, you know, people who are swimming long distances, they have burnt a lot of oxygen. Yeah. They're doing three-minute dive times mm, yeah. where they're constantly working for three minutes, you know, sometimes longer. What, what about statics? How do they translate to spearfishing? Are they something we should focus on? Look, statics is an un... un uh, what would you call it? Uh, you get great gains of static, but they're just so uninteresting because they're boring. Yeah. You know? What is a static? Just explain it for everyone. Static, right. it's a static apnea, static meaning still. So, so you face down in the water, it's just still. Breath. How long can you hold your breath? And then until you start... Doing these ones. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, a person, you know, actually a person who's sort of uh, got used to it, you know, uh, you might do, you know, three minutes of almost bliss if you're sort of up at that level, yeah. and then you got two minutes of absolute yeah. hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, what, why is it good for spearing, though? Is it? Look, it's just good for changing your uh, your metabolism. Right. To get into breath hold diving. Uh, the reason that someone's been doing it for 10 years can go down there and spend, you know, two minutes on a dive and come back up, breathe, and then go down and spend another two minutes on a dive, come back up. The reason they can do that is because they've changed the way their metabolism works. And it's not been an overnight process. You speed it up by doing pool training, but you don't quickie it. Mm. It still takes time in the water. Yeah. Time doing the stuff that works. You so know? this is kind of building this this mammalian dive reflex that we all have. Yeah, exactly. So metabolism is one component of it. Yeah. Well, your you're changing your whole metabolism and how you use the oxygen. You know. Yeah. So someone like me who has been at it for a while, and we did a test not too long ago. Uh, we had one of these. Um, things around your chest, you know, where you measure your heart rate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it came with one of the Cressy watches or something like that. And uh, mm. Robbie brought it out and says, let's do a, let's do a test here at, mm. uh, at uh, the uh, Adreno Mustard. So he wrapped this yeah. thing around my chest, you know. And I, here I'm sitting here going, I've just had one hell of a cup of coffee. And I knew my heart rate was screaming, you know. Uh, it was up there about 88, 90 or somewhere around there. This is my yeah, resting yeah. heart rate after coffee, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, oh, you know, this is not going to be comfortable. But I knew that I could hold my breath and I could probably go two minutes without much change in that because I would do that. That's just what I know my body. Yeah. So I breathed out all my air and I knew that as soon as I get my first contraction, my heart rate would drop. So I breathed out all my air and that means now no, my 
carbon dioxide uh, level is going to go right up. There's nothing for it to exchange, and it's just going to be so high in my bloodstream. <clears throat> Within 30 seconds of breathing out all my air, my heart rate plunged down to 34, from 80, uh, 88 and 89 to 34. Wow. Now, this comes because my body went, oh, he's doing this thing again, you know, and he reg registered the high carbon dioxide, and all of a sudden went, boom. I can tell you it did not feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> felt yeah. pretty horrible, but yeah. it was 38 beats a minute. So that's a trained dive reflex. That's right. Yeah. And so in that time, not only was my heart rate go down, I felt tingles on my body here because now my blood was no longer circulating to the to the uh, out extremities. Some extremities so I had the blood shift and I knew that I at that point in time I had a big injection of hemoglobin in the blood from the spleen it would have gone boom yeah. and measure a trained diver and this diver was has huge injections of hemoglobin in the blood someone who isn't trained and hasn't done the hard yards time and time again doesn't have much at all. They hardly yeah. register a change. And so, uh, you know, I can sit here and do a big breath hold and a new person would have a try and he would be struggling past 30 seconds, you know. So that's a real interesting point. So that, that splenic contraction where it releases all that haemoglobin, what, what, at what stage of your breath hold is that, does that kind of happen? This is the tough part okay. because it actually happens when you start feeling shit. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. When that... Carbon dioxide comes in and kicks in and you go, oh, no, you know, and you get that, that, yeah, and you get that urge to breathe. Well, this is your dive reflex kicking in. Yep. Now, the hard part is we all got to find out where we are on that. And mm -hmm. I've trained with a guy and he would have his first contraction at 75. And if I let him go past 80 or 90, he's blacked out. Wow. Yeah. I have my first contraction at about 60 or something like that and I can swim, you know, way past 150. Yeah, yeah. So you get the idea. So it's yeah. really individual and it's only training that gets you to know where you're at on and that. And so the swimming pool's like a perfect place for it because it's a controlled environment. You got it. You yeah, couldn't, yeah. unless you've got safety divers all around you, you could not do this stuff out on the ocean. The ocean would punish you. Guys, finally a magazine Turbo won't get in trouble with his girlfriend for reading. <laughs> <laughs> Sparing Magazine, it's the world's best spearfishing magazine and they kindly sponsor the Noob Spearer podcast, which funnily enough is the world's best podcast. Oh, it's so, a match made in heaven. <laughs> Together at last. Join Sparing Magazine on Facebook, Instagram or YouTube and connect with sparingmagazine.com. I was going to say, right, one of the things of value I really found with the training was that you're keeping an eye on everyone and you're looking out for consistent issues that Sparrows have, right? What are some of the same issues that you see popping up over and over again? What are the consistent things that all of us can work on to get that extra 10 seconds on the bottom? So probably the first thing is, is if you just have to do it regular. Hmm. It's, you know, getting a long breath hold and getting a long working breath hold is all about training over a long period. And I say this to the bull sharks, my training squad, uh, and it's not what you do tonight. It's not what even you do this week or even this month. It's the fact that you relentlessly keep turning up and you do it time and time again. That's what makes the changes. So you can get big changes in a guy uh, when he arrives in the pool by going, OK, streamlining. All of yeah. a sudden, you know, water is 800 times more dense than air. So by streamlining, you've just released a lot of uh, effort that he's done by bending his knees yeah. and, you know. Having elbows out. Yeah, what, elbows what, is down. A, what is a great uh, finning technique? Because that's something that's safe that anybody can improve on, even in the ocean. Yeah, finning technique should be straightish legs. Yep. You get taught right as a swimmer. The movement's mainly from the hips. There's not a big knee up in the front. There's no leg up at the back. So it's sort of like this. You've got a 10% or so uh, knee bend here where the, the actual knee bend is just to help extenuate the motion that's come down here. And because you're using this section here of your, uh, of your body, your hips and that, you also bring into play all your muscles around here, your obliques uh, and your core muscles as well into it. So then those muscles, they go a long way without using a lot of air, mm -hmm. you know. Where these muscles, this is the biggest muscle in your, muscles in your body, these huge, um, 
muscles here, they chew it up. Yeah. yeah. So then the other thing is the big long sweep, as soon as you bring your legs outside your body uh, profile, <clears throat> profile yep. you stop yourself in the water. So here we go. Kick, you're moving, and now you're stopping yourself. Okay. Mm. Now then we kick, we're moving again, and now you're stopping yourself. So that doesn't make sense. Right. So then you want to get your fins going. Modern fins. These lovely yeah. carbon, carbon fibre fins are made to, to make do this. So with this little action here, the fin goes whack at the end. You know, and that's yeah. what it's all about. Right. So your feet are moving up and down about six inches, uh, yeah. seven, six eight inches, inches yeah. around there. And the fins and the far end are going flick, flick, flick. Flick, and that's what you What after. about keeping them straight? Because I know one of the things you notice with me that with weak ankles, that they were twisting. So yeah. what does that sort of do to my my efficiency, I guess? Yeah, when, if the fin's coming down and it twists like that, you're losing the water off the side. So you should probably have larger rails on the edges of your yep. fins okay. to hold the water in. Uh, you shouldn't have a wide yep. fin. You should have a narrow fin. Yep. And so these things will bring control in on your fins. Mm. Okay, so that uh, rather than have a fin that goes boom, spill, boom, spill, I tell you what, we've videoed them and yeah, we've watched them yeah. spill out the side, and you just go, wow, what a waste. Yeah. yeah. Look, I want to come back to some more focused QA with us in a sec, but I want to throw it open to the audience for some specific problems they might have with their freediving. Just while people are thinking of questions, I've got a big one. I've been out of the water for near on 18 months now. Um, which is terrible for a spearfishing podcast co-host, mm. but, um, <laughs> but but how do you recommend I get back into it? <laughs> how, how, how long is it going to take me to get back to where I was? Well, look, that's an individual thing, but you'll probably be fine if you've spent enough time in the water earlier, it'll actually come back fast. Oh, yeah. Because the body recognises what on. you're doing. <laughs> You know, if you've done enough time putting your dive reflex in, it won't be long before your dive reflex is yeah. in. It's not like you have to do it all over again. Maybe just show up at bull sharks a couple of Yeah, more. and you know what? The other thing is you let that spearfishing drag you out there. Yeah, right. You know, on. get out there, and even if you're struggling in a shallow, get out there and, you know, chase those fish because that's going to get you really fit and that's going to get you fired up. You know, if we weren't doing the spearfishing thing, you know... Training a lot of it, yeah, be training would be pretty yeah, boring, yeah. you know. All right. <laughs> All right. How do you keep it in an interesting lane? Because I struggle. I've been wanting to come and I just... It's just I find swimming laps boring. You're one of the low yeah. motivated people. Yeah. Talking. Well, you know, the point is, is that, uh, you know, some people like to jog the pavement yeah. and some people like to, you know, do uh, uh, cycling. But the bottom line is if you don't exercise, you're going to go to crap. Mm. You know, so you've got to find out what nice. you're going to exercise <laughs> at. So what a great cross sport for a Spiro is to exercise twice a week on all the muscles that you're going to be using out in the ocean. You know, yeah, all your leg point. muscles, getting your breath hold. It's, you couldn't get a better cross sport. Now, if you are diving in, you know, like, I mean, another good one uh, cross sport is underwater hockey. That is mm. a great cross sport. It doesn't lower your heart rate, though. <laughs> but it builds your fitness. Wild. Yeah, it's fitness. It's yeah. great for that. And your leg fitness in particular, funny. Yeah. All right, any questions, guys? Has anyone got any questions? We can't really bring a mic to you. Steve! Steve, champ. Um, I'll just reiterate it for the mic, for the recording. Uh, so champ, in a really long and bad way, asked you how long should he spend on the surface after a dive? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question, and this is why I dive with a computer because once you start doing some deeper dives you really need to keep a track of this um, and everybody has a different uh, a different sort of uh, um, tolerances but you do need to get uh, in control of it because we have a way of cheating ourselves and you'll know when you've done it we get up on the surface and you go yeah you get your breath back and think oh I'm ready already great you know or oh, I'm feeling good now I've been up on the surface for ages and you get down there and your next thing you're back down there and then you go and you realise you weren't that ready. So the dive watch is helpful for keeping you accountable. Yeah, right. you get on the surface. My main use of the dive watch is I, I don't use alarms or anything like that. I just want to know my recovery time. So, like, okay, so you do you do a 20, <coughs> 20 metre dive. You're down there for 65 mm. seconds. What's your surface interval? So if the total I, I mean, dive... It, 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 maybe it depends a little bit on people's fitness and, and if that, that's a limb, they're pushing themselves mm. for that, but in general, what's a good rule? Look, in general, a good rule is three times. three times. 
and the three times is a good rule uh, and I've really made experiments with it two times I can get away with doing two times most of the day but at the end of the day I'm rooted yeah, yeah right. Is that an international saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. yeah. I just, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm had it, you yeah, know. Yeah. But and my final, you know, for the final few hours out there, you know, all of a sudden I'm going, I'm at 12 meters, and I feel like coming up already. You know, this yeah. is terrible. However, if I do three times in a, you know, uh, quite strict about it, at the end of the day, I'm still capable of doing plus 20 metre dives. So Turbo, he's down there for 15 seconds or whatever, 45 seconds, he's all right to go again. That's what you I would say, oh, yeah, yeah okay. but, you know, I would sort of, you know... Perfect. That's why we call him Turbo. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so three times is good. Now, three times is also good because if you're diving some serious depth, you've actually got to get rid of some of the nitrogen out of your system. And I'm talking if you're... If you guys finish... <laughs> These guys are celebrities. They're like prima donnas. So uh, if you're diving serious depth, and I'm saying 28, 30 metres or something like that, and we have divers who are doing that, and uh, uh, if you're doing that sort of level and getting serious downtime on it and you start short-circuiting your recovery time and some of these divers are capable of doing that, you're going to get a build-up of nitrogen bubbles in your system. And this is getting bent and this is uh, something that does happen to Spiros. We've had Spiros be bent in Australia, and these guys are very able Spiros, you know, able to do long breath holds to deep uh, depths. So, and it is a problem for those guys. So getting used to tracking your time on the surface is very important, especially once you start diving past 25 or, or something like that. Cool. Steve, that was, was that a good, all right answer? Right. Good. Right. Anyone else? All right, down the back. So he asked us if it's better to keep the snorkel in your mouth or spit it out. So it's uh, uh, definitely a, a spit out job and there is a reason for that because it's a safety, uh, a safety point on all free diving. Why? Because you've just put two seals before you've got air in, uh, water in your lungs. Now, that's all very well if you're all under control, but if you go down and you've waited a long time for something and then you get tangled at the end of the, the uh, dive, you get tangled up in your line uh, or in a fisherman's line or something like that and you're late coming up or you've stayed down too long for a snapper and now you're getting huge contractions, you have enough energy in a contraction to pull past the glottis, right? And if you can do that and you've got a mouthful of water, that's not going to be very good. Yeah. But you haven't got enough. You've got a seal here. You've just made yourself that much safer. So spit the snorkel, tuck it under here, go down. When you come back out, tip it out, put it back in. Get used to doing that. Yeah. You actually tip the water out of your snorkel. I do, you know. I've never don't, heard of that. I just never. tip it out and yeah. put it in my mouth, you know. I always just blow it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I like the perch valves too. I don't care what everyone says. What do you, what's your opinion on perch valves? Look, when I'm going down, and I'm going down, uh, say, 20 or 30 metres or something like that, I don't want anything flopping around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the smallest I can get, and even that, even if it's a small straight pipe yeah. with just a, a mouthpiece on it, that still flops too much, you know? So yeah. do you like a rigid snorkel or one of those kind of...? Uh, in between. Yeah. I want it something that if I go through a cave, it does flex and yeah. doesn't sort of go <laughs> into my mouth like, yeah. a, like a punch. It's a yeah. super important bit of equipment we don't really think about a lot. Yeah. But you just know when you've got one that pisses you off. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Good, great Q&A, some awesome questions, guys. Um, what's the funniest thing you've experienced out in the ocean? Look, this is something that happened to uh, Ant and I, and look, Ant did a podcast and he brought it up. It's still the funniest thing. Oh, I know this story. This is the most hilarious thing. We were on the pinnacle when, before it was a green zone, which is off Foster, 28 metres to the top of the reef and drops away down to 50 metres on the edges. Really good place. It's got Jewies there, always a school of kingfish. We had worked out that if we went down and hung on to the top of the reef at 28 metres, we had to only hold there 20 seconds and a school of kingfish would come in and have a look at you. So we worked this out. And so, uh, but we were with a friend of ours, Mike, and he couldn't get down there. He'd go down and he'd come straight back up. He just couldn't work it out. He just, he wasn't, didn't have the breath on. And he was very new at the time. I, I wouldn't do it either. So... <laughs> And said, OK, here's the deal. We were on his boat, so we were out to get him kingfish, you know, and there's the deal. And said, I will go down and I will wait 20 seconds. 
then if you stay on the top and 20 seconds after I dive, you dive. And by the time you get down, the fish will be there. And so we went, okay, that's a really smart idea. Me, I'm going, I'm going to leave those guys to that. I'm going off to go and do some spare fishing, you know. So Mike, uh, Ant goes down. Sure enough, he goes on. He does what he said he was going to do. He holds on to the top, holds 20 seconds. Next thing, Mike comes down. And sure enough, the kingfish have come in. Mike is a born hunter. Plonk. Takes the kingfish. The kingfish rushes off. But Mike is at that point now where it's not a just a little swim to the surface. It's an absolute crawl and panic to the surface. He's at 28 metres, as deep as he's ever dived. He crawls to the surface. So at that point, Ant sees a school of jewies. So Ant says, OK, I'm going to go and chase these jewies. Mike's gone up the surface. He goes off. He gets fairly close, and, and he shot a jewie, and a jewie breaks off. I'm about 20 metres or 12 or 15 metres away and I see the dewey break off. So then I swim over to where I saw the dewey go, thinking that he's probably just over the rock and maybe he's sort of struggling on the other side. So meanwhile, and he's, he surfaces. Now I'm down there and I'm trying to get down over the top of this rock to see if the dewey is on the other side there. Mm. Next thing, I'm ripped backwards. My rope is ripped backwards and I'm going, what the hell is going on here? So I get hold of my rope and I'm going, I need to get over there. And I'm going, like this, you know. And I'm getting, you know, I get a little bit of thing. And next thing, oh, I'm tugged back again. And so I'm really like, this is, and I'm quite deep and I'm actually getting close to the end of my breath on. And I'm going, oh, no. So I'm a bit, also a bit brassed off. And so I go, oh, and I drag and I pull to the edge of the rock. And the next thing I'm ripped off this rock and I'm going, I have no idea. And then I go, oh, maybe someone's seen a, a great white or something and it's encouraging me to come up to the yeah. surface. That I had to have something that made sense. So, okay, so I'm just standing, I'm grabbing my gun like this and I'm allowing myself to get pulled up. And I go, okay, it must be something serious. Next thing I come up and I come up to the top and here's Mike at the top there. And I come up and I go, what? And he looks at me with his eyes open and he goes, oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks around like this and I'm going, what has happened? And he sees this other line. And we've got the same rig line. <laughs> he sees this other rig line and he grabs that and starts pulling that one up. So, so you were the ugliest kingfish he's ever was, seen. Yeah, I shocked him. He goes, what is that? I, who knows what he thought, whether I'd sort of dive-tackled his kingfish or something. So whenever we... Whenever we come across, we ever talk about this. It's just hilarious, you know. Yeah, look, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up, yeah. Wayne. Um, been an absolute pleasure. Um, we'll, we'll hang around and have some have some beers and have a chat with Definitely. the guys that are left. Um, obviously, people can come and find you on Instagram. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Probably uh, if you want to talk spear fishing bits and pieces, yeah. come on and pose it on bull shark. So that's kind right. of like uh, not so much spear fishing, but that's more my uh, training page. Definitely interested in training, you know. There's a lot of good hunters out there. I'm a lazy hunter, just so you know. I'm a lazy hunter. I don't push too hard. It's my recreation. I get there because I persist, and I've got a few species up my sleeve because of that, you know. So, you know, there are a lot of other people who are better hunters than me. You come in on Friday, talk to Trevor, and he's a great hunter, you know. So check them. You want to talk training, come and talk to me. Yeah. Okay, so where can people find Brisbane Bull Sharks? It's a Facebook page. Okay. You know, so we train search. at Somerville right. Pool and search, just go straight on to Facebook. The Brisbane Bull Sharks, Bull Sharks is a single word, Bull Sharks. All right. All right. One, one final tip for, um, for people out there. What, what's, your, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Go down and stay on the bottom, throw sand up. <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. was absolutely great. <laughs> That's one of those absolute basics, yeah. you know, and I went years where I didn't do that, you know. Oh, right. Years, okay. you know, and then one day I went, how did you get that? I did. My son Anthony teaches me stuff, you know. You've got to get to the <laughs> stage in life where sometimes you have to be able to learn things from your son. Well, now he's an awesome coach and a great spearfisher. So, you know, he says, you really got to go down and lie on the bottom. OK. It was a few, <laughs> few years ago now. And now. OK, you know. So I went down there and sure enough, next thing I'm pulling jobbies and, Beautiful. you know, all those fish that you get that come in on that. Yep. Awesome. All right, cheers, Wayne. Thanks, Good. guys, for listening. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks,
Hey guys, awesome interview today. Turbo, some practical takeaways? Absolutely. Finning technique, keep nice and streamlined, keep those legs straight, uh, and that'll cut down on your oxygen consumption. Yeah. And also another big take home, guys, that I know Wayne touched on, and that is be careful with your CO2 training because you can override some safety mechanisms there in your body, and uh, you can learn to basically not need to breathe, but eventually you'll get burnt. So make sure that, uh, yeah, you, you keep that in mind. I know Wayne touched on it, but just a safety thing. If you have more questions about freediving too, head back for one of our episodes, uh, Freediving for Spearfishing. It's more uh, formulaic and uh, kind of some basics about the basics of, the, of freediving for spearfishing. So, but uh, yeah, if you can join a pool training group, a phenomenal thing. And uh, Wayne's Brisbane Bull Sharks here is a, is a fantastic effort. We'll link it up in the show notes if you want to go and check it out. And, uh, and Wayne's Instagram profile as well, so check him out there. Um, look, in a fortnight, we're headed off to do a, another interview, I believe. Yeah, so we're going to chat uh, with Chris Dillon again. Um, from Spear Junkies and we're going we're gonna to chat to him see, catch up with what he's doing um, Shrek interviewed Chris I was busy trying to fix a roller door on this headache of a house I've bought so uh, Sh- Shrek fielded that one and sorry Chris but I just had to get that thing done there was too much pressure on me if you know what I mean and so, and, uh, so yeah, excellent episode and then we're going to chat about another topic after that dry, dry training so this tonight was uh, this episode is really about pool training next week sometimes you can't get to the ocean or the pool so we're going to do some dry training basics that you can do just to maintain your freedom and fitness and uh, maybe even make some gains while you're away from the ocean. Beautiful. Love it. All Practical. Right, um, what are actionable. We, actionable oh. advice. Information oh. to improve your spear wow. fishing. That's what we're all about oh, here. 99 tips too. It's a uh, big thanks to everyone that's that's uh, bought the book. It's in a, a lot of a, f- a fair few stores out and about now and we'll I'm sure we'll have an ad in this episode to let you know where you can get a copy. Yeah, ch- look, check out 99 Tips. It's in every Adreno store, Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth. It's also in Spearfishing Superstore up in Cairns. It's in the dive shop, Port Lincoln. Frog Dive in Willoughby have just taken it on, and we've also got it in Spear and Fish down under in Newcastle. A whole lot of locations in Australia you can buy it from. If you're from anywhere else at this stage, you can get it on Amazon now, um, in a, yeah, on a soft cover, and also on Indiegogo. It's still available on there. You can get a hard cover with the Spiro Log free. Um, so look, thanks for tuning in, guys. Leave a review. Awesome to... Give this to you today with Wayne. All right. Chat to you in a fortnight's time. See you guys. Ever thought of yourself as a bit of a writer? Well, here's your chance to write something for Spearing Magazine. That's right. Head to spearingmagazine.com and submit your article now to be published in Spearing Magazine. Now, they're not just going to let you in. Trust me. We've had a fair crack at this and we're still not published. But if you're better than us, you'll get in Spearing Magazine. So get on over to spearingmagazine.com and submit your article. Yeah, Spearing Magazine runs on high-quality contributions from Spearos just like you. They've had stories from every Every corner of the globe, get on sparingmagazine.com. G'day guys, in today's episode we have talked about lots of different spearfishing equipment. Chances are you can get your hands on most of it at spearfishing.com.au. They've got competitive prices and an awesome hassle-free returns policy. They uh, have $15 flat rate shipping Australia-wide. Chances are, if you order that equipment today, it will be at your doorstep tomorrow. And you can even save a little bit more money by using the code NoobSpero at checkout. That'll save you a further $20 on every purchase over $200. It also helps support the NoobSpero podcast. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and save some money on some gear. Thanks for listening, guys.